Good morning. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to uh, present today. I represent the UK community. Uh, I will talk a little bit about why we're doing these things uh, and how we uh, measure greenhouse gases from soils. Uh, you can see a long list on my slide, all my collaborators uh, involved in this work. So my talk, first of all, I will give uh, the background, as I said, why we're doing this in the context of the UK greenhouse gas inventory, uh, the movement of the UK government in order to improve the methodology, uh, and I will then go into the uh, details of the static chamber technique uh, and a little bit on automated chambers. So, um, agriculture in the UK contributes about 8% of the greenhouse gases. As you can see there, uh, after 2012, there was a trend of a decrease in emissions, uh, ma the majority from nitrous oxide, um, based on the 96 guidelines. We are now moving to the 2006 guidelines, so the picture changes a little bit. But the important thing I want to show here is that this methodology is based uh, on IPCC default. So, um, N2O, as I said, is an important contributor. And I show in this slide uh, soils as a source of N2O, mostly dominated in the UK by indirect emission from leaching and runoff, synthetic fertilizers, and grazing. I, the square of manure management, because that doesn't, is not included in soils, but some other sources uh, that contribute all uh, to nitrogen input into soils. So, the agricultural inventory is comprised by a few categories, as you can see there, uh, six sources of which soils, uh, soils is included, and, oh, sorry, and as I said, we follow IPCC tier one methodology with some country specific data and default emission factor. So, um, DEFRA uh, was concerned that we didn't have a specific uh, inventory or country specific inventory. And back in 2009, there was a big movement of a gathering of scientists together with policy people to try to improve the inventory for which um, there was a derivation of three large projects. As you can see there, uh, one project aiming to improve the uh, quantification of methane emissions, one project to improve the accounting of nitrous oxide, and another project what is called the data mining project, aiming to gather information that already existed to put together to improve the methodology. Uh, the top box is the inventory, so all these projects are to underpin this improvement of the inventory. So I will focus on one box of one of those projects, which is the uh, measurement side. So um, DEFRA then funded this, uh, pro uh, this program, which is a large, large consortium. Uh, we me we uh, plan to measure emissions from soils, both from grassland and arable soils. A, s a series of uh, sampling sites were identified, trying to cover a range of uh, climate and soil types. As you can see, I'm not sure it's very clear, the red dots says uh, nine sampling sites were selected to do this, and a series of uh, fertilizer types to, uh, to assess uh, rates of nitrogen, different timings, application of nitrification inhibitors, and simulating grazing by applying dung and urine to soil, as well as applying manure. So as you can see, this is quite a large undertaking that we had to uh, plan as, as best as we could. Um, so 
how did we decide to do these measurements? We decided we would use the static chamber technique because as we've heard today is uh, probably the, the, the best methodology we have currently. So what we have is uh, chambers that we place out uh, uh, in, the, in place in the soil, collecting uh, manual uh, gas samples from the headspace and putting these samples through our, an automated gas chromatograph. So what are the issues uh, that we had to face when we were trying to plan how we would do this measurement? So we have heard today a lot about um, the spatial variability issues. Do we have less chambers, more chambers? How do we deal with the linearity in the headspace? So um, how many samples do we take from the headspace? Um, the temporal variability, what time of the day we take the sample, so are we taking on the maximum or on the actual uh, time of the day representative of the daily mean, and also how we estimate the cumulative fluxes, so this is very important too. So um, we started then thinking about all these issues, and uh, what we did was to use statistics to try to, um, to, try to de de derive a protocol for our measurements. I'm not a statistician, but I work with a statistician in order to analyze quite a lot of data that we already had uh, to try to develop these protocols. So to assess the spatial variability of the fluxes, we uh, got hold of data from four different sites, uh, different soil types and uh, crops. These sites covered uh, a, a range of locations in the UK, as you can see there. So Hillsborough is in Northern Ireland, then we have Crichton in Scotland, and then Rosemount and Wobbon in England. So um, I will only show a couple of examples, but the Crichton site uh, located in Scotland is a grassland site. It uh, intends to have high fluxes, so that was the high end uh, or one of the high ends. Uh, what we did is we chose a couple of days, one that was a uh, high flux day and one that was a low flux day. And we did, uh, as you can see there, there, are, there were, uh, don't, don't worry about reading the, the treatment, but there were 11 treatments um, for, uh, for each of three reps, so three blocks. And we had five chambers on each of these uh, plots. And you can see that uh, the variability uh, in the low flux day could be uh, quite large. Uh, we can also see that, uh, and if I, oh, sorry. If I show, uh, for example, the uh, third block, perhaps a tendency of have less emissions overall, if we look at the high flux uh, day, uh, again, we have, and if we look at the scale, this is up to 1,000 uh, grams per day, uh, very large variability, but mostly on blocks one and two. So you can uh, clearly see that not only there is variability within the treatment, or within one plot, but also between treatments or between blocks. So if we look at the low flux site, so the Rosemount uh, site is an arable site and emissions tend to be lower. Um, then again, if we look at uh, the high flux day, we have quite large variabilities. On the low flux day, perhaps on the first block, not so much in block three. So we, we can generalize that uh, there seems to be more variability on the arable site, but also we identify very large differences between treatments, within treatments and between treatments or between blocks. So um, we were interested to know what difference it makes to have one chamber or five chambers. Uh, we took the Hillsborough site, uh, which is uh, in Northern Ireland, and again, is normally uh, quite high in fluxes. And if you look, here, we determine the standard deviation uh, for the data uh, 
whether we had from two up to five chambers. If we look at the scale, we started with 2,000 here, 300, 250, 175, showing that the error decreased as we increased the number of chambers in the plot. So this is quite uh, uh, an important uh, message when we are trying to uh, compromise on, and, and select how many chambers we have. If, um, if I plotted as an example, uh, these are three treatments, so this is the amount of N applied from 80, 160 to 240 uh, kilos N per hectare. Um, increasing the number of chambers, we can, we can see that there seems to be a, a tendency for a larger flux. Um, you could think about this in perhaps uh, a way of uh, having a higher chance to hit a hot spot if you have more chambers. So if you have less chambers, perhaps you, you, you diminish that, uh, that chance. Um, so we then uh, decided that the five chambers seemed to be uh, a good compromise. Uh, and, and that's what, we, uh, that's what we, we've done. Uh, but then we had to face the next uh, challenge, which was uh, how about the linear accumulation inside the chamber, or is it linear? So that uh, comprises thinking about how many samples you take from the headspace, what the timing for the closure is, and what T0 you have. And we have heard today a lot about this, uh, and we understand it's a challenge. So what we did, we took data from uh, seven sites, again, uh, as shown in the, on the map, and we, uh, we had from these sites uh, chambers that had been used to, uh, well, that had, had been sampled from taking up to five samples during the closure period. So what we did is we fitted a nonlinear function to that data for each chamber. And uh, when we found that the quadratic term was not different from zero, we assumed there was linearity. So we did this analysis. And <laughs> don't worry about reading. I just wanted to show um, the range of nitrogen sources, soil types, and crop time, so we analyzed, we had quite a lot of uh, data, but if you look at the percentage nonlinear data set, and I hope you can see that bit, most of, uh, well, about half of them are less than 10% nonlinear. Uh, there was one high, uh, which was the, the Northern Ireland site, but we, looking at the data in detail, we realized there were quite a lot of very small fluxes uh, so they tend, they tend to be not linear because the, uh, the, the concentration inside the, inside the chamber might be fluctuating a bit. So when we removed uh, those low fluxes from the data set, then we found that 13% of the, of the data analyzed was not linear. So taking all those data sets and doing an average, we calculate for the total of 1,970 1, chambers um, that in average less than 8% of the chambers were not linear. Uh, you can see in the last column uh, the sampling times as well, as you have said. So we have 0, 20, 40, and 60 minutes, or 0, 15, 30, 45, and 60. So um, we we uh, trusted that we had enough data that gave us the confidence that for our sites, for our soils, we could assume that uh, most of the, uh, the, the, the chamber uh, would behave in a, in a linear way, in a linear way. So, um, in order to test this a, li a little bit further, we took those data sets that gave us non-linearity and we fitted a linear function and a non-linear function and we found that the bias of fitting a linear fu function 
would be uh, an underestimate of 20, 26%. So we can estimate what our error is by using this data as well. So um, based on this, uh, we decided that we would take one sample from the headspace of the chamber at 40 minutes. So the methodology was then uh, set. So we close the chamber and at 40 minutes we take one sample. Then we had to decide what to do about the T0. So do we take a sample when we close the chamber or not? So again, we had data uh, that uh, in parallel with the linearity, what we call the linearity chambers, we uh, took some ambient samples. So we had uh, five ambient samples before the, the run, so before the actual sampling period, and five samples afterwards. So we then went to analyze this data, and again we had a few sites where we uh, gathered the ambient and the T0 we had from the linearity chambers. We applied Dixon's test in order to remove outliers from both data sets. So sometimes the ambient you expect to be about 0.3, but then you get um, one that is, is obviously wrong. So that's what the Dixon's test did for us, remove those ones. And then we um, estimated how many uh, of the samples were different from the T0 and how many were equal to T0. And if we look at the last column here, we see that uh, except for two sites, uh, the percentage of ambient equal to T0 was over 58%. Um, so the average was 56% of the cases show no difference between T0 and ambient. So what we did then, um, we, following a similar approach as we did before, we took those examples or those cases that gave us a difference between T0 and ambient, and we estimated the flux using those two values. So we had then uh, two fluxes to compare. And here on the y-axis, you have the flux calculated using the T0 from the linearity chamber. On the x-axis, you have the uh, flux calculated with the ambient value, or the mean of the, of the ambient. And the, um, the line is the one-to-one -one, uh, line. Um, and you, you can see that we, uh, we obtained a, a regression that was uh, satisfactory, but we know that the, what happens here is that mm -hmm. at the low fluxes, there is more scatter. So there is more error in this assumption when the fluxes are low, and we can kind of uh, guess that uh, as, as, a, as a logic um, result. So, um, we could say then that the nitrous oxide fluxes were similar whether we calculated them with the T0 or with the ambient. So what, did, what this did for us was that we could then uh, add to our, our protocol uh, another step, which was we don't take a T0 from the chamber, but we take 10 samples uh, from the ambient, and that's what we use as our T0. Um, I will, I will show a little bit later why this is, uh, that th this is crucial for us. Um, and the other thing that we uh, wanted to look at uh, was the actual gas chromatography, gas chromatography analysis. And based on the uh, Zeng et al. paper that uh, shows uh, interference from the CO2 in the sample on the N2 analysis, we um, decided we wanted to test this. So what we did, and I mentioned earlier, this is a big consortium. So we obviously had to have uh, some kind of reference that we could all uh, test uh, as we are trying to pull together all this data. So what we did was we uh, had uh, standards 
two different concentrations of the N2O and two different concentrations of CO2. And we wanted to test whether there was any effect from the CO2. So these standards were sent around to all the partners of the consortium. And they, it was a blind test, so they didn't know what the concentration was. Um, they analyzed them at least five times, but hopefully 10 times. And uh, also, they, they did their own calculations, so they had their own standards to, to estimate the concentration. So using a t-test, we proved that there was no effect of the CO2 on the N2O signal. And just to show the, what we call the ring test, so the results of this test showing uh, the two levels of N2O and the two levels of CO2, there were a couple of uh, labs uh, here and a couple here that were uh, different, but overall we, we were satisfied with the results. So based in, on all this, uh, this uh, analysis, we developed protocols uh, that we shared around for, the, for all the sites, all the participants in this program. Uh, protocols covered uh, different fertilizer applications, so we had the dung annuring protocol, we had the inorganic fertilizer protocol, and we had the, the manure protocol, those slurry and FYM, etc. Um, and the protocols covered not only measuring gases, but also cover the soil analysis we should do, wh what kind of ancillary measurements, the, me the MET data, uh, how to, to measure the yield, and, and what kind of procedure we should follow. So we, uh, we, we had set out exactly the recipe we should follow. But also we had, in, uh, at the beginning of this process, we had uh, what I call the training sessions where all the technicians that had to learn how to make this measurement got together and they all learned how to take the gas sample, for example. So we, uh, we, we, we tried to, um, to homogenize the, the deployment of this, of this protocol. So an example of, of an experiment. So I mentioned earlier I, I wanted to show why it was important for us to have this protocol is because of the magnitude of the experiments. And here you see uh, on the left, yeah, the left hand side, uh, we, we see um, the three blocks. Sorry, I'm trying to use the curse. We see the three blocks here, um, the top, the top half uh, correspond to application in the spring and the top, the bottom half in the autumn. So these are two different experiments. Uh, we had a lot of, a lot of uh, treatments. We had, uh, I think about 11 treatments. So if we multiply that by five chambers, we are talking about 150 or more, more chambers. So it's quite, it's quite a big uh, undertaking. And the way we've done it, and somebody mentioned it earlier, we do have three technicians at least doing this at the same time. And they are working along simultaneously. So if, if you had one person doing it all first, it's impossible physically because it's, it's hard work. But also you end up taking hours doing this, and we try to minimize the length of time to take this sample. Um, okay, so how the plots were laid, we had, uh, this is not necessarily how the plot would look, but these are the things that had, had to be in a plot. So we had the wind tunnels to measure ammonia, we had the static chambers to measure greenhouse gases, we had an area for harvesting the grass, for example, measuring the yield, uh, or for uh, an arable crop to measure the, the yield as well. Uh, we had an area for doing the soil sampling, so obviously it cannot be where the chambers are because we don't want to disturb that area, and poroscopes when we did uh, the leaching experiments. In addition, we had, in each experiment, uh, when we could, we had one auto chamber. 
So I'm talking about uh, 50 static chambers and one auto chamber. Um, I should also say that for each block, there was one linearity chamber, so there will always be one chamber that, uh, that is sampled uh, four times. So we get at least four samples from the headspace. So um, we've talked about spatial variability, and as I showed in the box blocks, we are talking about uh, quite, quite a few fold difference uh, in, in the space. There is the other uh, side of the story, which is the temporal variability. And you cannot cover that with a static chamber. Um, we, as I said, had one or two chambers, so the ones on the right-hand side is the one we use on, in, in our greenhouse gas platform. But on the left-hand side, I just show one, uh, one photo of an experiment we did back in 2011, where we deployed static chambers in parallel with Lyco chambers, but we also measure N2O. We, we had an extra analyzer, and we uh, had a lot more auto chambers deployed at the same time. So the auto chamber we used for this work, uh, in a way, is similar to your manual sampling because the system has a carousel, and I don't know if you can see the uh, there, um, what it does is that uh, the carousel is uh, fitted with vials and there is a needle that goes uh, and takes a sample uh, and, and puts it in the vial. And then at the end of the day or the two days, depending how frequently you measure or you sample, you, you take the vials in the lab and you analyze by GC analysis. So um, these are the sites that we had data for. Not all of them were for a complete year because the auto chamber uh, is automated, but it does give a lot of trouble. So they do break down, and then you have a gap in, in the data, unfortunately, which you don't have with the static chamber. Um, and as you can see, we also had arable and grassland and different fertilizer types and application uh, rates. And just to show one example, where the black line is the mean of the five static chambers. Uh, the green line is the auto chamber. So these auto chambers were deployed, uh, taking samples four times in a day except when the fluxes were smaller, we went down to twice a day. So each of those points is the mean of the four times. And it's interesting to see that the static chamber seems to be high <laughs> relative to the auto chamber. But the other interesting thing is to see that peak later on, uh, 30th of July, that the auto chamber picked up but the static chamber couldn't because we didn't measure at that time. So pros and cons. Uh, we, uh, we, we know there are limitations, but what we then have to do is think about how we estimate the cumulative from this data. So um, we use the, the most common method, which is a trapezoidal method. So we integrate the air under the curve to calculate the total emission, but you can imagine what happened when we did that. So um, static chamber seems to be a lot higher, but let's not forget that we are talking about one auto chamber uh, versus lots of static chambers. Uh, it is possible we could think, I mean, this act, actually this auto chamber is not too different from our static chambers in the volume. Uh, and in fact, uh, height and area is, is, is similar. Uh, so you could actually include it as, as another static chamber if you wish. So ideally, um, you want lots of, lots of auto chambers. But I, I thought it was worthwhile showing this. Because um, here you, we, we see a, quite a large difference, especially on the, on the higher end. But if I then 
uh, digamos, blow out the, um, the lower fluxes. And then we look um, here at the differences. We can see that, yes, there is a difference, but this data is integrating over the whole period. So I then thought, what happens if I only integrate when we do high frequency sampling? So let's get rid of the background side of the, of the, of the year, only compare when we have high frequency for the static chamber. And then, well, let's just look at the scale here. So we're talking about, um, well, a thousand for the highly autumn. Now we've gone down to 250. So they are still different, but the, the difference is less. So there is obviously an issue with the static chamber because we have high frequency sampling after fertilizer application, and then we relax and sample uh, a lot less. And if you finish with, with a low flux, and then you integrate, that's okay. But if you finish in a high flux and then you measure two weeks later, then you are actually, uh, you are introducing a large flux that might not be true. So uh, that, that's another, another issue. So this graph here, um, what I did was, uh, I said earlier, we had four times of the auto chamber. So each of the green points there is uh, so we've sampled at 5 in the morning, 11 in the morning, 5 in the afternoon, 11 in the evening. So each of those points is the cumulative emission calculated for each of those times, as if uh, I only had that measurement. So there is a hint of a diurnal cycle there uh, in this summer experiment, and that red spot, uh, spot is the, the mean of those four points. Now, if I put the result of the static chamber for that year, you can see how the static chamber is much bigger, but we've seen that already. If I look at the spring data, then again, uh, the four points, the diurnal seems to change, um, and the static uh, is still higher. But when we look at the autumn, um, this time the diurnal is similar to the spring, but the static seems to be similar. So I think um, you, yes, measuring as much as you can is the best thing, uh, but obviously we have to make some uh, compromises in order to achieve what we need to achieve. So we, we have uh, validated our methodology. Um, we, we have published this work, um, but we found that there are large differences between uh, treatments and between, pl uh, between plot or blocks. And generally, m the fluxes were larger from grassland soils, and we minimize errors or reduce errors when we increase the number of chamber. We uh, think a special variability probably uh, overlays uh, any other bias in the measurement. Um, this, this resource will be used in combination with mathematical models, mechanistic models uh, that we have in the UK in order to uh, develop new emission factors for the UK. So the, um, the uh, manual for chamber methodology that was published by the GRA and is available online as a PDF, but also important to say that this is an ongoing or a progress uh, document. So when we wrote this, this, this methodology, we agreed that it's not set in stone and that we should revise the methodology and update it as we find uh, other methods or, or, or other results. Uh, so the paper uh, where we uh, present what I've presented today, Chadwick et al. as well, and also you can look in the website of the Greenhouse Gas Platform. Now, just, just to finish, I just wanted to show uh, briefly our uh, farm platform. So this is a 75-hectare uh, uh, farm. Well, it's, it's a section of our farm. Uh, so it's a large experimental site. It's a national capability. And I am deploying the LICO chambers in this, in this farm. Uh, so I've got three systems with 12 chambers each. 
and uh, just wanted uh, to show a hint of the kind of data you can get, which uh, is ideal because we can see uh, any, any daily variability or, or seasonal. But of course, um, there are downs to this because uh, you need a tractor to get the caravans out in the field. So if it's winter, it's not possible. Uh, so we have to measure in the spring. Um, you also, uh, it's automated, but uh, I don't think there is real automation in this world. I think you all have to go out and check your instruments because if you wait a week, and then when you go back, you find that something didn't work, then you lost a week of data. So I think you must, if you have automated system, you must keep an eye on them as much as you can. Uh, finally, um, the, my co-authors at the beginning didn't include the people who are involved in this farm platform work, so I put them there. Um, and yeah, any questions? Thank you. technical support for the more technic complicated auto mm -hmm. samplers. Is that something you guys built yourselves or is that something no. that's available? No, um, we've, we've purchased them. Um, they're okay. I mean, <laughs> some people were more lucky than others. We were lucky in, in our sites because ours worked well, but also our technicians. Uh, that's another thing we did. The technicians got together to get training to use them, but our technicians really got involved with it and are, they can troubleshoot them and they can keep them going. Um, you, you, have to, you have to check that it closes properly because with time they might not have a proper seal and, and then again you, you lose your data. So you, yeah, they are good because, I mean, they, they need, obviously, they, they need power. Uh, we, we do have power because of this platform. Um, or you can have a generator. You don't need to move, you know, like with the Leica system, you need to move a big, big car. Um, so you can deploy them all year. Um, so, yeah, I, I can pass on the contact if you, if you were interested. I think, that, I think that might be interesting to this group, yeah. Yeah. Just a follow-up question on that. Does the auto sampler use less power than the Lycor? Could um, you use a battery or something instead of a generator? Mm, no, I think I think you need a generator for it, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Lycor, because it's on the farm platform, we have mains power there, so we, we it's easier. These other ones, we have to put a generator out in the field, but but it stays there, so that's okay. Um, you said you found higher fluxes in grassland versus arable soils. Are you talking about similar management practices, similar fertilization, and how can you compare these? I, I'm wondering. This is a, something we've seen uh, already before. Um, it seems, obviously, the soil is different. So if, if you think of the UK, the map I showed that on the west, southwest, we have the grassland. It's, most of it is heavy soil, so it's clay soil. Uh, it's very rainful, very rainy. Um, the east of England is, is drier, and the soils are with less clay, more sandy. So I think there is, yeah, the, the behavior is due to this, what we call geoclimatic differences. So in generally speaking, and we have grown the same crop in, in both sides with the same management, and generally speaking, fluxes are lower on the east. Uh, we only have preliminary data, but I think the mission factors for the east 
will be lower than for the West. I mean, you can still grow crops in the, in the West. There are some soils, that, yeah, which is why, I should say, why we've managed to, to compare. Because although the, most of the West of England is grassland and, and livestock, there are some soils that are, you can use for, for arable. So we, we've, we've done the comparison. Uh, you said that <coughs> the uh, N2O fluxes uh, labels is affected by the uh, labels of CO2 in the sample, in the gas samples. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, when you use a gas chromatograph, we can determine all N2O, CO2, and CS4 mm -hmm. from one, one gas samples. Mm -hmm. What would you do in samples when, in a treatment, when you already have a high CO2 labels from that treatment? How do you take take care of those CO2 when you determine into a plus if the CO2 level is too high? Well, we don't, we don't do anything because we, we saw from our results that there didn't seem to be interference at the levels that we are measuring. But what Seng et al. recommends is you, you, could, you could scrub out the CO2 uh, so you don't have CO2 in the sample. When your slides you show um, uh, N2O emission among different uh, nitrogen treatment, you show 80, 160, and 240. Uh, do you have any explanation why your higher nitrogen rates actually have a lower N2O emission? They're higher? Okay. Uh. That one? Yeah. Um, well, it's the trend, but looking at the arrow bars, they're not different, are they? So the arrow bars of each of the, so each of these, uh, the 160 and the 240, I don't think are, diff are going to be different. follow up on the question of sorry did I, to follow up on that in into oco2 influence so on were these all does everyone have the same gc running the same flow path um so i guess i was wondering are you know is it going through you know if you're doing methane also through the methanizer to convert this all to co2 and then are they splitting and so it it's going to both the fid and the ecd detector um, or is it going through the FID and then through the ECD? Because some, some detectors would actually go through the FID, combust that off, and then it would run the nitrous afterwards, I believe. Um, so then you really wouldn't have any CO2 left. So I, I was just wondering if, if it was the split pathway, so there was still a lot of CO2 coming through, or if you, if you knew on that. I, I can't really tell you how different the GCs are. I don't know. Uh, obviously, everybody... We didn't necessarily purchase the GCs for this. We already had the, the GCs, but mo we, most of the groups already had their, their instrument. So I don't know. That Maybe that's something we so need there, to there think about. Variability, yeah. variability in, the, in the flow yeah. path of that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. That's a good point, yeah. Let's thank Laura, and then before we take a break, uh, we have an announcement from Stacy. so. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.